I know it's been hard work for many of you to get here. Many of you are ill. You're carrying a lot of burdens of problems, and some of you are carrying a burden of grief as well. So it's great to have you here, and I hope what I say will be useful and helpful to you. Well, that's who I am, and uh, this is what I'm involved in. My story starts with the Gulf War veterans and also with the Autism Research Unit, which is, uh, which is there. They're putting the water or something. Right, this is where I started with syndromes of uncertain origin in the Merck Manual. These include Gulf War Syndrome, which was called by some people the ME of the military. Also in this category is ME-CFS and fibromyalgia, and also is multiple chemical sensitivity. And also, when you look at it, there are gonophosphate poisoned people as well, who all fit into this same category of a multi-system, multi-organ illness, which is, uh, covers every major system. Here we are. Um, neurological, cardiovascular, immune, gastrointestinal, respiratory, and endocrine. The problem is that, considering the extent of the patient's complaints, so you're all morning minis, uh, you know, well, you know that already because people have told you that ad nauseum. But disability is recognized as well. And the routine laboratory tests are strikingly normal, so there's really nothing wrong with you. We've all heard this story. Uh, and so the answer is in psychiatry and somatization, and it's all in the mind. And if we change your mind, we'll change your illness. That's the strategy. This is the evidence that, in fact, if you start looking at symptoms, where you've got 17 symptoms here, and they're shared by a whole range of syndromes. Organophosphate poisoning, Gulf War syndrome, uh, MCS, multiple chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, CFIDS, which is American for ME, CFS. And then we've got, at the end here, we've got two columns, multiple sclerosis and HIV AIDS. Now, this, this tells us, all the pluses show that the, where they're all correlating, really. This tells us that an, a major neurological illness and a major immunological illness share many of the symptoms of ME. So there are clues here. In just collecting this sort of data, you find that there's an, a, a pointer to this extensive damage that's caused uh, to the neurological system and to the uh, immunological system. Now, it's important to get an intellectual underpinning for this. And this is important because you'll see later on. There is an intellectual foundation for ME and these overlapping syndromes. And it's called the, it's a mouthful, I'm sorry, the neuroendocrine immune paradigm. This is something I was organizing lectures for 20 years ago. Uh, and the drug industry didn't want to know. They turned up in 35, turned up to my meeting. Uh, but anyway, that's how it was. But this is just to show you that something that Bruce was saying already that these different systems all interact with one another, communicate with one another, and send messages to each other. So it's not surprising that we have neurological symptoms, we have endocrine symptoms, and we have immunological symptoms being initiated in people who've got ME. Many of the messenger molecules uh, are uh, shared by, between these different systems, and that they, if you affect one, you affect the others. That's just a, an example of a paper which shows diesel exhaust alters the immunological balance. Why should diesel exhaust alter the immunological response? But it does. And that's the paper. That's the evidence that shows that, that that's the case. This is the, what we're looking at is the anatomy here. This is the brain. And we've got the uh, pituitary gland here and the adrenal gland here and the, uh, the spinal cord and the, and the, the brain there. This is a, a uh, sort of... Uh, presentation, which, which is certainly not anatomical, but it's showing that the CNS, the endocrine system, this is taken from a paper in 1991, an immune system, the pineal, are all intercommunicated, all spending messages, and we receive the challenges of the environment that can be, it can be psychic, psychological, which is why people faint when they see a, a, an accident, and there's no reason why they should, because they've not been hurt, they've just seen something, uh, or heard something, people can find things like that. Then there's the environmental impact of temperature and magne ma uh, magnetic effects and electrical effects. And then you've got the environment with uh, microbes and tumors and antigens and antibodies and the immune response here at the bottom. And this is an attempt to restore homeostasis to a disturbed system. Uh, and that's the coping mechanisms. And these appear to be out with 
the capacity of people with ME. You suffer an insult or a disturbance, and getting back from that is very, very hard work. And this is just to prove that it's complex, as Bruce was saying. We've got here the central nervous system, stationary cells, messenger molecules, which, go to, which are in the, generated from the nerves, the endocrine with its soluble circulating messengers, and the immune system with circulating cells and circulating molecules and, and glands and tissues. This is a merry-go-round. And unscrambling this is difficult. This is complex science. And if we, but we can recognize that it's complex science. We can see that it's there. And we can say, well, this is a complex picture we're looking at. And we need to dig down into it to find out what's going on. So it's a complex system, but it has an intellectual underpinning. This is 1998, this paper. You know, it's a long time ago. So cytokines and you know, corticotrophin, releasing hormone and things like that are all things that, that are part of the, your story and, and uh, our stories. And in this story, definitions and names are critical. Progressively, uh, in the popular presentation, MHE has come to be defined as a chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a diagnosis of exclusion and crucially dependent on fatigue of greater than six months. I think that six months actually is crucial, because if you get in early with ME, you can, in fact, produce effective treatments. Uh, I'll mention that a bit later on. Almost all physical symptoms and all biochemical markers have been gradually removed from the definition, and everything directed towards a psychiatric definition. Many different illnesses and conditions are associated with this kind of broad brush classification. So we've got a ragbag of people who are ill with what has become labelled as fatigue. So ME is a lot more than just fatigue. And we're indebted to the Canadian consensus for, for drawing that to people's attention. But in the WHO consensus, in, in the WHO classification, what you're looking at here is a neurological illness. It's classified as a neurological illness, has been from 1969, and it's myalgic encephalomyelitis, a neurological disorder. And the only allowed alternative names are post-viral fatigue syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome. That's the two alternatives to, to ME. Now, this has lots of implications. This is a debate uh, in the States, and this is Dr. Donna Dean. She makes the point that ME and CFS carries a significant stigma for patients. Well, you don't need me to tell you that. You know about that. The medical community bears some responsibility for invalidating this illness. And again, you don't need me to tell you that because many people have tried to invalidate it as far as you're concerned. Patient advocacy also bears some responsibility. This is not my words, these are Dr. Dean's words. Because we do get in a tangle with ourselves. We lock horns and argue, and we often get ourselves upset with one another and make accusations about each other. And that's got to stop if we keep pro progress going on. We need to work together as fully as we possibly can. The other thing is that here's a, an, official, sorry, an official panel which says it's significantly biased towards behavioral and mental aspects of the illness. So we're batting against uh, we, we're playing uphill, as it were, in this half. Co uh, Anton Koronov, uh, Komarov makes this comment, that none of the participants in creating the 1988 CFS case definition and name ever expressed any concern that it might trivialize the illness. And that is what it has done, actually. We were insensitive to that possibility, and we were wrong. And they were wrong. And that's why it's important, I think, that the ME nomenclature is restored for patients and for doctors uh, and for the sake of the international classification system. This name divide is one that is common amongst doctors. Doctors will not talk to you about, most doctors will not talk to you about ME. They'll talk about CFS. I think many, most of you have that experience. But patients insist on using ME. I don't want to talk to you about ME. I want to talk to you about CFS. You've got chronic fatigue. And they drop the syndrome bit as well. So you suddenly get translated from being a patient with ME to one with chronic fatigue, to one with fatigue. And so it's a downward slope into nothingness, really, the non-entity. But the biggest divide is psychiatry, all in the mind, somatization, biopsychosocial um, versus the biological organic illness. This is where the big divide, this is where the fight is at the moment. And there's research on both these areas, and I want to just tackle some of it. Uh, this, you may applaud if you wish. Uh, the this, this, is, this is Simon Wesley's work, and it came out, again, out of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and out of the Gulf War Vets. But he tries to embrace, under this somatization label, 
various syndromes associated with the different medical specialities. And um, I think that is, in fact, something that is, is worrying because he's coming up with a common solution to all these different illnesses. The feature of these, the, if he does that and he's successful, then you've got a common, a common pattern of illnesses which submit to the same therapies, which are CBT and graded exercise. And he claims partial support, but not for most of these, I don't think, because I think the support's just not there, although it's claimed. The problem is they cannot be explained by conventional medicine. So you're a problem. Well, you know that. Conventional therapeutics in, uh, therapy is ineffective, and most of you know that. That's why most people go into the com complementary medicine to find ways past it. It's more common in women than men, so really it's all hysteria. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the simple explanation for a man, and he should be hung, drawn, and quartered outside this building if he says that. They share non-specific symptoms. Well, uh, as you heard this morning from Bruce, that some of these symptoms are not non-specific; they're very specific if they're attended to. But that was a stage, and this, you can't read this, this is a ploy to see whether you're awake and test, rub your eyes. This is the mental health group, uh, movement and persecution of patients, a briefing paper uh, that some of us prepared for the Countess of Mar for a debate in the House of Lords about ME and about the deceptions that are being practiced in the nomenclature and naming of the disease. That's where it's available from, if you want it. And in the debate it was claimed that the ICD-10 nomenclature was not, could be, uh, occur in, in different locations. You could have it at ICD-10 under neurology, or you could put it under mental and behavioural under F48.0. Uh, it's quite legitimate for that to happen. Well, when the WHO were asked, they said, no, it's not legitimate for that to happen. That is not acceptable. It's not, a, it's not possible or acceptable in the terms of the protocol defining these rules. So accordingly, Lord Norman Warner, who is the Parliamentary Undersecretary for Health, wrote to the Countess of Mar in these words. The UK accepts ICD-10, therefore, that's important to note, you can go to your doctor and say the, the, the Minister for Health has accepted the ICD-10 definition of your illness, of ME, as a, a neurological illness. Therefore, it was, it was pointed out after relatively new, that's not true, that's, not, that's an untruth really, and this is where you've got to be very careful with politicians who can be very slippery uh, on occasions. That was not a true... 1988 is not recent. Uh, and so the adjustment's going to be made to the versions of information that had gone out to GPs that was already placed on, on websites. So the information was already out there, distorting people's impression. And most GPs, are, I know, are very hardworking and have a lot short of time. So there is a real issue around this... Uh, provision of information to GPs who are hard-pressed. The, will, will, the second edition will carry the revised information and say so there's only one code, G93.3, neurological. But at my understanding, this has not yet been done. Some of you may know better, but if you do, you can give a chance to say that uh, sometime in the meeting today. Somatic medicine, some psychiatrists are very uneasy about this, and this is what one of them says about it. Total lack of scientific support. That's why the science is important. It reclassifies bodily symptoms as a mental problem, where conventional medicine is at a loss for an explanation. Lack of firm knowledge is converted into speculative assertion without any critical voices. Well, there are plenty of critical voices, but they're not being properly heard. Causal explanations of the illness go with predominantly somatic symptoms that lack any similarity to known mental disorders. This is a creation of a mental disease by translating bodily illnesses into a mental disorder. And this is what's very disturbing about it. And Martin Walker's written about this with some perception in Skewed. An evasive argument with a lamentably poor record of research into causes, particularly where environmental factors are concerned. This again is what Bruce was saying about the environment and the, the, the way we face, identify a patient within an environment. If you look at the environment and lose a patient, you know, you finish it with a smile. Industrial in, in, interests are actively influencing the course of what is ostensibly a scientific decision. Ian Gibson touched on this. He doesn't like the, the pharmaceutical companies. And this is, I'm afraid it is true that we're up against the big conglomerates, the big multinationals and corporates who are not interested in our disease. They're interested in making money. 
and that was from a research director of a major British company. What makes an individual being ill cannot be determined by statistics. This was again what Bruce was saying earlier. Individualized medicine, you are an individual. You're all lovely, cheerful, bright individuals uh, and uh, need to be treated in that way. Lack of knowledge is a considerable handicap in the treatment of all chronic diseases. That's why Wesley could get away with his, his suggestions earlier on. This is Pear Darlan, and that's on the, on the net, so you can get it from the net if you want it. So this is the sort of thing that's going on. This is, a, this is an important paper by uh, Norman McLaren from Australia. It's entitled The Biopsychosocial Model and Fraud. And this is a very important paper. The model is based on fraud and ignorance and a complete misunderstanding of the origins of the idea, which came from a man called Engel who said we must be more humane in the way we treat patients in psychiatry, to which we would all say amen. But uh, they went on to create a theory on this, uh, which led McLaren to say he sees psychiatry under attack from all quarters, some people see a great future for us, but I don't share that view. I believe there is a serious risk that psychiatry, as we know it, will no longer exist in a little as 15 years. The reason is simply the lack of anything approximating to an adequate intellectual foundation framework for our efforts. Well, I gave you our intellectual framework for the biological approach. What he's saying is there isn't a an intellectual framework for the biopsychosocial framework. And that's important. It's, it's a, it's a non-entity. And he's written a paper called The Myth of the Biopsychosocial Model, and that's the reference, 2006, so we're up to date. And he's written also uh, in a textbook, which is a, you can find at this website, in chapter 7 and 9 especially, about this in more detail. And that, this model was the basis for the rejection of the Gulf War veterans' class action, a legal case, brought by them, uh, and which was, uh, has just been uh, looked at by the by West and his colleagues in the philosophical trans transactions of the Royal Society. I'm very worried that the Royal Society is getting itself into arguments about these illnesses uh, because they are becoming partisan and biased in a way that I don't think the Royal Society should be, or good scientists should be. We should look at all the evidence. And so I'm proposing that we suggest to the Royal Society that they have another symposium like this one where people who hold a contrary view allowed to make this, their case with good science. But the misrepresentation still goes on and worse. This is again from Wesley and his colleagues. Uh, this is who you are. Do you recognize yourself? Brief infection, usually viral, vulnerable perfectionist personality and pressure at work. Uh, employee sickness absence sort of records, fatigue, <coughs> prolonged bed rest, maladaptive beliefs, chronic invalidism, termination of service on medical grounds, all lazy children. I mean, this is insulting stuff. And we need to be called insulting stuff. And it has a knock-on effect on pensions and benefits that people can claim. This is from Stephen Ralph at ME Action UK, who's another good guy who puts a lot of information on the net and... Uh, People cannot remain ignorant for any longer. The battle continues in this. This is a paper which looks at psychological amplification of biological sensitization. So they're moving ground already. They're acknowledging the biological basis for sensitization, but it's amplified through the psyche. And this is what you've got to do. This is, this is taken from their abstract, the end of their abstract uh, do not listen to your own body's signals. Do not trust your feelings. Do not trust your thoughts. I mean, this is appalling stuff. And especially after Bruce's lecture, which he said that it's an, the key is the patient-doctor uh, relationship in teasing out and clarifying the patient's experience. But you, you've, got not, you've not got to listen to that. Some great guru is going to say, well, it's all in the control, my dear. You'll be all right. We understand your illness, but you don't. But we can change the way you understand your illness by using CBT. Um, and unfortunately, this has been adapted by the current clinics, which are weighted towards the psychiatric theories and pacing, CBT and GET, with psychiatrists in charge at mental hospitals. That's what's actually happened. So this is not something that's dead. This is, 90, this is 2005. 
It's very much a live issue. It promulgates treatments based on psychiatric models and the BSP model. Graded exercise, of, this is a statement from people in Australia. This is a very poor paper. I brought it with me, so if people want to argue about it, I, I can pack it with them separately, but there isn't time to do it in, in this presentation. But this paper is a dreadful paper, very poor, very poor uh, in, in many, many ways. But it led to this conclusion from an editorial in the Journal of Australian Medicine, Medicine Journal of Australia. One can safely conclude that these studies, that graded physical exercise should become a cornerstone of the management approach for patients with CFS. This caused absolute uproar. And so people wrote in and said, that's not true. This is one of them that came from Scroop and Burnett in, in Adelaide. CF patients are not deconditioned. Neither their muscle strength nor their exercise capacity is different from other sedentary members of the community. We remain unaware of any incontrovertible evidence on various exercise training programs suggested in the previous articles to imp that improve neither physiological, psychological, nor clinical status of people with CFS. So that's full house, really. Uh, doesn't work. There's no evidence that's at all satisfactory to this end. But this is what's going round. This is what you have to contend with, and what we as scientists and clinicians have to contend with as well. This is from the ME group. This is uh, Simon Lawrence, another fantastic guy in my book. Comments on the treatments given, person-centered counseling, helpful. This is, this is the two columns are helpful and unhelpful. And person-to-person -person talking is helpful. Psychotherapy, not very helpful. CBT, not very helpful at all. 93% said it's no good. Graded exercise, 95% said it was no good. Pacing, most people do that anyway because you realize your own limits and how to learn to live within them. So it's not a massive uh, uh, rocket science to, to uh, identify that. Alternative therapies, quite a number of people find that on benefit helpful. Symptomatic care management is helpful. Pain management is very helpful. But we're spending eight million on something that the patients are saying is not helpful. And we need to take that on board and to challenge that. MCS, MECFS is not clinical burnout. Some, there are some psychiatrists and psychologists and some physicians who say it is, but it isn't. This paper shows it isn't. And neither is it deconditioning. That's a Scroop and Burnett paper we've already looked at. So what we've got here then is the information which says it is not burnout, it is not deconditioning. Now you know that, but it needs to be noised abroad in the academic community and amongst the clinical community and the scientific community. This is the Fukudi definition. Uh, most of you will know this by heart better than I do, but again it's got this six months duration of, of fatigue, medically unexplained symptoms of new onset, um, not the result of ongoing exertion, not substantially relieved by rest, substantial reduction in previous activities. Well, you know that. Four of the following are included, or can be included. Memory, concentration, sore throat, tender lymph nodes, myalgia, muscle pain, headaches of a new type, unrefreshing sleep, and this is the key one, post-exertional malaise. It's after exercise that the problems start. Multi-joint pain with swelling or redness. This is Vance Spencer's work. Vance is a great guy in my book, as I've already said. And this is his comparison. All these people, these different groups, met the Fukudi definition. Go for uh, MEP patients, organophosphate poisoned, and go for veterans. And you can see here that what you've got are some things which are very similar. This, the second one along here on concentration. Nearly all of them have serious problems with that. But when it comes to muscle pain, 94% of people with ME have problems with muscle pain, less so with the other two groups, much less so than the other two groups. When it comes to joint pain, it's the other way around. With joint pain, what you've got here is the Gulf War veterans have got significant problems with joint pain um, down here. And then you've got the problem of headaches, which are common, and you've got post-exertional fatigue, which is very common. So they are different. This is the evidence. This is the scientific, clinical evidence that people are different and they're not, that we're not dealing with the same thing. 
This is the FS36 scores. I don't know how many have filled in these forms, but this is an attempt to classify. It's, it's all paperwork. No one examines you. You fill in a form and they look at the, 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 the data. Physical functioning, social functioning, uh, role, role uh, uh, limitations and uh, physical problems, role limitations from emotional problems, mental health problems, vitality, energy scores, pain, general health. Now what you see here is this is your normal group. Batting, normally people bat around the 70 to 80 mark. If you're a fit soldier, you should get into the 85 mark. If you, that's where you should be. This is the, the blue is the OP poison people. The red is the MECFS people. Look here where the problems are. Not in emotional, not in mental health. So you, you're really reaching normality in this response. So how can it be a mental illness if the mental health is good and the, and the emotions are good? And then the Gulf War veterans down here, batting along around about 20%, 20 to 25%. These guys are seriously ill. These are sick Gulf veterans. First time they've been looked at. Avoid looking at sick patients because you might find something you don't want to know. Uh, now, what Wesley tried to do was to distinguish between sick and healthy Gulf War veterans using his nomenclature. And he set a bar here at 72.2. I don't know why 72.2. To distinguish between sick and healthy Gulf veterans. Above there, you're healthy. Below, you're sick. And he tried to do this in a paper that he uh, uh, put out with uh, uh, quite recently. It's worth just noticing here that a lot of people have fatigue from lots of other illnesses. MI, my, myocardial infarction. <coughs> chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, depression, diabetes. This was Haley's submission to the Lloyd Report on the Gulf War vets. Wesley could not distinguish between sick and well people on that classification. So his basis is flawed, irreparably flawed. The Canadian consensus, I don't want to spend time on this, but this is Bruce's work. I think it's fantastic. I think it's very important. And what it provides, as a, I'm not a clinician, what it provides is a lot, an abundance of clinical science for people to get their teeth into. A good doctor should be able to pick out of these things that he can do in his, in his office. He doesn't need to cut you off to hospital to do some of these tests. So that's, this, I think, is very important. And it covers the immune system, the neuroendocrine system, and the autonomic nervous system. So we shouldn't be surprised at that. Leonard Jason, uh, in a recent paper, talks about the need for subtypes. And he makes this distinction between CFSME with comorbidity and psychiatric comorbidity. Uh, he talks about the neurocognitive function in many tests are nearly normal. He talks about the socio-democratic um, ratings. He talks about the virology, immunology, neuroendocrinology, autonomic nervous system and neurology, genetics and treatments. But he also makes a point that after three years, people who received CBT had no discernible effect. So there's your science. There's the, there's the answer. Just to remind ourselves, we're dealing with a chronic illness, often severely debilitating. We're dealing with official obfuscations, denials, and sometimes downright lies. Myalgic encephalomyelitis is defined for us in the ICD-10, which has been accepted by government. It's, it's an, an attempt to deceive that, in that classification by shifting it into fatigue syndromes, which are mental and behavioral rather than neurological. The trap has been sprung with the establishment of new centres for the treatment of ME by psychi psychiatric techniques. Tied to benefits and support, and the illness is all in the mind. So let's look at the science now. Back to the future. Uh, this is the back bit. Uh, the old man of uh, wherever he is, Byron. Uh, I'm being rude to Byron because I know him quite well, and I'm allowed to be rude to Byron. But this, this came out in 1992, and it's a, a, a compendium of enormous information of all sorts of modern techniques that have been used to look at ME. And they find all sorts of disturbing things. Imaging problems, uh, they can see on imaging. They've got numerous clinical studies and multi-system effects and some effective treatments. This is my great mentor and friend who's now sadly dead, John Richardson. This is his book. Any clinician who wants to know anything about ME should read this book. Because he talks about the viruses, he talks about the cardiovascular consequences, the CNS complexes, the, the glandular endocrine problems. He talks about it in pregnancy, he talks about it in cancers, the relationship to toxins in the environment, and he talks about treatment considerations. It's a major clinical work. It's a lifetime's work. And uh, it's 
he was published in 2001 and he died in 2002. So he gave his life for this and he gave his all. And uh, he looked at PET scans, which are available, they can be done. He looked at differentiating ME from depression. All these things have been done. This was by a man who's worked for 50 years in this field. This is an interesting paper from Chia, or I think that's how I pronounce his name, J. A. Clinical Pathol, 2005. And what he says here is the enterovirus story, which was espoused by John Richardson as a major source of ME, is now being revisited by Chia. And he's saying that the recent evidence not only confirmed earlier studies, but also classic clarified the pathological role of viral RNA through antiviral treatments. So he's, this, this paper judges that the enterovirus story is a valid story. It's been neglected for 10 years, and they even produced treatments with ribavirin, which is an antiviral, interferon alpha, which is a, an antiviral, pleconeril. Uh, Dr. Betty Dowsett's here, and she's been using pleconeril. John Richardson used pooled immunoglobulins early in the disease. That's why the six months, we need to set that aside, I think. A good physician will get there well before six months, and treatment can begin early with his pooled immunoglobulins, which are very helpful. And John Richardson had another uh, treatment with choline ascorbic acid, and we'll see why that's relevant in a moment. These are papers which look at heart and enteroviruses. This is the work of um, Peter Muir, who's a member of the research group that John Richardson established, and there's no doubt that these uh, viruses do damage the heart. Uh, Len Archard, in the second paper, who is also a member of John Richardson's group uh, from time to time, enteroviruses causing post-viral fatigue syndrome and metabolic myopathy. Again, problems there. Peckerman is a, an interesting paper, we'll return to this, but he looked at abnormal impedance cardiography, which sounds a mouthful, but it's relatively easily measured to predict symptom severity in chronic fatigue syndrome, which is the usual, usual terminology in America. So there's no doubt that things are affected in a big way, the heart's affected in a big way. I went to visit John as he was dying, and we, I talked to him about the work that was being done with Gulf War veterans, particularly that affecting the, the uh, basal ganglia, which are the source of Parkinsonian symptoms. And I talked to him about that, and he said, you're absolutely right, and he's absolutely right. When I looked in John's book, there's this 15-year-old boy who develops Parkinsonian-like symptoms following a viral illness, involving violent abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting. So all these connections have been made. And these toxins from viruses, from allergens, and from chemical toxins all open the blood-brain barrier and let stuff into the brain which shouldn't go there. The basal ganglia is now damaged by chemicals and possibly by vaccines and infection. And I know Ellen Pirro is here today. She can tell you a, a dreadful story about what's happened with vaccines in Norway. Underlying these, I think, is a common immunological medicine, uh, immunological me mechanism which has been defined uh, by, actually, Sedolnik and Le Bleu, but it's written up in this book, which is edited by Kenny DeMila, who you will all know, and Patrick Engelbien, uh, an in-depth consideration of the 2,5 RNA synthetase pathways as a basis for persistent aberrant responses to intracellular microbial infections underlying MECFS. The new key molecule. It's a latent enzyme in most cells that is synthesized in response to an interferon gene activation as a consequence of presence of viral RNA. Transformed to an active form that degrades RNA from viruses and some cellular structures. So you're losing the virus RNA, but you're losing your own as well. So that's one of the reasons why people are ill with virus uh, infections. Um, and it degrades cellular structures, including mitochondria, which are the energy cells of the body energy batteries of the body and cells. Very tightly regulated, because if it gets out of control, you've got problems. ME patients have an aberrant form of this enzyme, a low molecular weight that escapes regulator controls and continues to degrade cellular RNAs. The mechanism appears to be general, provoked by a whole range of intercellular pathogens, although Gao has queried the, the validity as a diagnostic tool. And the mechanism remains valid, I think. ME can therefore be defined as an illness associated with an aberrant immune response that persists in damage to the host. The organisms invoking this response include viruses, and by definition they're intracellular, uh, a whole range of viruses, including the herpes group, which are big viruses, DNA viruses, as opposed to some of the others, which are RNA viruses. 
Chlamydia, rickettsia, borrelia, TB, BCG, mycoplasmas, all these have been implicated in various studies by various groups. And you, those of you who know about the literature will know about these references. But they all seem to be doing the same thing, upsetting the balance of the cell, or they're just jumping in when the cell's been damaged by the enteroviral effects. What about vaccines and chemicals? Because Bojani published this very important paper which showed this, this system was affected not only by viruses, but also by chemicals. So there's a link there, and Julian Kenyon's here today, I know, and Julian's practice reckons that about 80% of people have virally triggered ME, or 20% have chemically triggered ME. That's just a rough working figure from a, one practice, not statistically valid, but it's a useful guide. John Richardson also found patients in which organochlorine, things like lindin, mimicked ME, and he treated them effectively with his choline and ascorbic acid. So the story is there. It's just not viruses, it's viruses and chemicals, and it's been being told for a long time, but been ignored. One way of looking at these things is to look at magnetic resonance, spectroscopy, and imaging. The spectroscopy looks at the chemistry of the cells, so you can see what's going on in the chemistry of the cell, which is very, it's extraordinary stuff, really. And Bassent's in performing later today, so we've got the big man here himself. Um, and he's worked with, with uh, Dr. Chowdhury, who many of you will know. And he found these disturbances in these chemicals in the brain cells, which were taken to be consistent with membrane degradation following a viral infection. And John Richardson also knew about this, because that's why I put coal in into his magic mixture. But free radicals cause oxidative stress and are generated in the body to fight infection. So we're looking here at the uh, an, uh, a body's reaction mechanism, generating free radicals on a big scale and generating oxidative stress in the patient. And many of you know about that. You know what oxidative stress means. And this is the work by Pataka Montero. This is a monograph in Hoth Press 2003. One gene he looked at, early T cell activation gene with its ups upsonin, which is a, uh, uh, the gene product. But it affects bone, it affects the cardiovascular system, it affects the liver, it affects the skin, and the kidneys, the lung, and the, and the gut. It, the reproductive system, the auditory system, and cancer. So this is a gene that's multifaceted. I'm uh, keen to hear what Jonathan has to say because he's a gene man, really. But this is one gene. But it's got all the right, in all the right spots. Immunological activation, uh, got the problem with the cardiovascular, it's got the problems with the gut, and with lung, which many of you are aware of. This is Vance's work again. This is markers of oxidative stress. Isoprostanes go up. They're the gold standard markers. Oxidative, uh, low-density lipids go up. The good guys are the high-density lipids, which go down, and glutathione, which also goes down. This is what we're looking at, a balanced system. If these get out of kilter, you've got oxidative stress. And when you look at the data, what you find is this is the same paper that I was talking to earlier about the Gulf Vets, the OPs, and the ME patients. And you can see that only in these patients is oxidative stress playing a big part. So oxidative stress is a key part of what you're going through. And they've related this in a more recent paper that links it to the symptoms of people with ME. So oxidative stress is a key marker. And you can, I think we'll just skip that because that's just the data, it's just showing you uh, these isoprostein levels that are, are raised significantly in patients with uh, ME, whether it's mild or moderate or severe. This is normal exercise in muscle. The fluorescence increases. This is resting. This is exercising. This is after exercise. Free radicals are generated massively, as the fluorescence demonstrates. Free radicals are generated in big numbers here. <coughs> The take-home message from this is graded exercise will damage ME patients. Now, you know that, but the evidence is there to show that, they, that, to show that that's the case. So it's important that you, this is a take-home message. Exercise generates free radicals which increase oxidative stress in a patient who is already massively oxidatively stressed. So that is bad news. We shouldn't be doing it. This is, this is James, who's looked at oxidative stress in muscles. Again, an acceptability. He, de he identif identifies increased oxygen uptake. Exercise-induced oxidative stress was enhanced. M-wave, which is a, a, a measure of muscle function, muscle nerve function, 
and the uh, duration is markedly increased, showing slow recovery. But HR, heart rate and blood pressure responses to exercise did not vary significantly from controls. Anaerobic pathways generating lactic acid particularly were not accentuated. So here again are three measures that can distinguish the oxidative stress suffered by ME patients. This is Vance's work that has not been published. I'm grateful for, for him for letting me say, say this to you. This is high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which can be measured very easily in the laboratory. So it's an easy blood test to do. And it correlates best with the clinical status of ME patients in, the, in a SPEN study, which is yet to be published. This is a marker of inflammation, oxidative stress and inflammation. This is why GET is damaging to people, and this is why it's myalgic encephalomyelitis and not myalgic encephalopathy. Okay, so the uh, itis uh, debate is informed by this information. It is an itis. It is an inflammatory state. You get free radicals from the liver in uh, metabolism, and one study in 1999 shows 80% of ME patients had compromised metabolism. The liver transforms chemicals by converting them into highly reactive molecules via free radical mechanism. If that is not uh, counterbalanced by what's called phase two metabolism, then you get excess free radicals swanning around. That's bad news. Genetics, Jonathan's here. This, I just want to very briefly look at his paper. 16 genes differ differentially expressed, 15 up and one down. Uh, T cell activation, that's immunological. Neurologi <laughs> neurological genes, which is a linked to the ICD-10 nomenclature, mitochondrial uh, genes, and this NTE gene, which is linked to organophosphate poisoning. So we've got the whole thing here. They've got the chemicals, we've got the energy, the fatigue, the mitochondria, we've got the nerves, and we've got the immune uh, activation. It's all there. And that's the science. And Jonathan's going to talk about this with far more authority than I can. The interpretation was there was... Uh, these are the cytokines, these messenger molecules that whiz around taking their messages to the body, T cell activation, neuronal involvement, genes associated with mitochondria and fatigue, gene associated with transcription, the cell apoptosis, which is cell death. When cells want to give up, they can give up in a controlled method and die uh, in a controlled way, which the body protects itself against that, the residue of cell breakdown. This is a caveat from a colleague of mine. The MRA was isolated from peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which is a usual way of getting them but they're not nerve cells, so there is a question about can we look at nerve cells in this kind of way. The NT gene, which I've already is linked to toxins. Thank you very much. John Gow has also done some work, which I haven't seen the picture, so I haven't got any of his data, but he's done work which shows that uh, gene expression is differentially expressed under exercise in ME patients. So that's the same, the same kind of thing, and they made a big appeal for, uh, for funding uh, through the newspapers and through television and radio. I don't know whether they're successful about that. This is the, the latest papers on pharmacogenomics. Uh, this is a, a journal that publishes 14, no, 19 articles here, a massive study. Sadly, they talked about fatigue. And that's what worries me about this study. It talks about fatigue. So it's undifferentiated fatigue. So you're going to get undifferentiated data. That's the problem. Uh, using the latest technology, to integrate a huge amount of information from a range of studies. And Jonathan, I hope, can say just a little bit about that. Uh, but there are some serious flaws in, this, in the way the studies have been done, which makes one worry about them. But I looked at these single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, in this paper by Gertzel. Gertzel. Um, he identifies three top genes. A neuronal gene, tryptophan hydroxylase, catecholomethyl transferase, uh, a nuclear receptor subfamily, uh, which is to do with steroid function and the control of uh, genetic uh, switching on and off. So we've got here nerve function, transmitter metabolism, and endocrine function, all covered by these, these single nucleotide polymorphisms. I haven't time to explain what those are, but I'll talk to you afterwards if you want to see me about that. But these have already proved useful in identifying many common disease susceptibilities, such as hypertension. Uh, but we're looking at here the interaction of multiple single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms. It's a formidable challenge, but we have the technology. So watch this space. And it's going to be very helpful to you guys. 
Vance did some important work on the cardiovascular aspects. I don't put this last because it's last. It's very important. And there you have it. Uh, he looked at blood flow and found blood distribution in patients was odd. You know that. Uh, when you stand up, do your legs go red? Uh, what happens on a tilt table test? Do you, or do your legs turn normal color when you lie down flat? That's blood flow distribution, redistribution. Um, it differentiated ME from Gulf War and from organophosphate poison people, a differential test, and it's very useful and highly significant. This is Dr. Sarah Myhill, who looked on the Peckerman paper and looked at, that's a good reference for you. She looked at mitochondria and the whole cycle of producing ATP in the body. And she's picked up on a support mechanism, a support protocol for mitochondrial function, CoQ, and, and as it, which uh, drives the uh, oxidative uh, respiratory pathways along with carnitine, which uh, is the process which feeds in the degrading of the uh, saturated fat, uh, unsaturated fatty acids into the, into the whole process of fuel, ribose, which is a key building block in ATP, magnesium, which is a key player in all these enzymes, and she couples this with uh, a broad vitamin supplement and a multimineral supplement as well. So that's a treatment protocol, which I think will be very helpful, and uh, I would encourage you to try that. And it's all on her website. This is our work where we looked at shared biochemical deficits in these, symptom, in these syndromes, uh, including autism, uh, which are associated with the gut, tryptophan metabolism, sulfur metabolism, and lipid metabolism, which is a big player in all these. This is another one on the blood flow in the brain, in the insular of the brain. Uh, it controls visceral function and integrates autonomic information. So that's a nervous uh, function. Separately, there's 20% reduction of blood flow in the left temporal lobe, which controls access to language. All this has been shown, demonstrated. There's no argument about it. And that's the address, which we've already had. And this is the important thing that he's talking about in relationship to the uh, CMO's working group. The aims were to clarify and characterize etiology, pathogenesis, epidemiology, natural history, all this. None of it's been done. So the challenge remains. So we've still got a, a way which you can lever government and, and the NHS using this report. It's their report. Thank you very much.